everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is answering all of your questions about MS. So if you haven't watched my previous video, which is my MS diagnosis story and my experience of living with multiple sclerosis so far, then maybe go and give that a watch first if it's something you're interested in because either you have the disease or you just want to know more about it, I would head there first. And then this video is kind of going through more questions that you had since that video was filmed um, and also just from any Instagram content I've been putting out, it has been MS Awareness Week so I've had so many conversations with you guys and just yeah putting lots out there and these are the things that you also wanted to know. Without further ado, let's get into the video. Um, I've just got them all in a note section on my phone, I haven't changed the order at all, they've just been slapped in there and I'm gonna try and answer them as quickly as possible. Some of them may have longer answers, but I think I need to just, you know, um, otherwise we're gonna be here for three hours. <laughs> okay, question number one is, how do you stay so positive? I think this is a complete misconception, perhaps with being on social media or just in anyone's life really, you do tend to see a lot of the positive aspects and although I do post the low points and down times, even when I do do that, I do feel a sense of, oh, I'm being really negative or people are going to think I want attention or, you know, so it is quite a hard thing to do. So you definitely don't post as much about being negative, um, but trust me, there are plenty of negative days um, when you have a chronic illness, that's just part of it, there's many down days, um, but there are better days, so perhaps I post more on the positive days. But in terms of keeping myself positive, I make sure to be really open with the closest people to me, so there's certain people that I know I can just kind of get things off my chest, talk things through, and that then allows me to either see things from a different perspective or just kind of vent and get it off my chest and get back into a kind of positive headspace. And I think just the overall sense that I get with having MS, which is that it could be worse. So I have quite a positive outlook because I'm actually more grateful than ever for my health and my mobility and my, you know, my sensations being back, my vision being on the whole okay. Um, I think when you have a health scare, you then just cherish feeling well even more, even if you don't feel well every single day or every moment of every day. So I think it, it's given me a shift in perspective which helps me stay more positive, but I'm definitely not positive every day. Does having MS affect you being a personal trainer? This is a really good question. Um, there's a couple in here actually about exercise and things. So the short answer is no, it doesn't affect me being a personal trainer. I can still do my job. As a PT, you don't actually need to be able to do a whole full hour workout with someone. Um, a personal trainer is more of a coach, so I can easily program whatever workout, whatever exercises that suit that particular client and what they're looking to achieve, um, and I don't have to do it. So, you know, if I was having a day where I was really fatigued or something wasn't quite right, I wouldn't be having to do 20 burpees to fit in with the session. Not that I'd ever program that, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying. I can always coach on the sidelines. The flip side of that is that I always want to feel well and I always do like to join in. A lot of my sessions, or in fact most of my sessions, are virtual, so I do them over Zoom, which means I can connect with people all over the UK and because of that it, it does often feel more like a class vibe. So for example, I'll go through the full warm-up with someone and then I will usually, obviously as well as demonstrating exercises, I will join in for certain parts um, and it works really well and most of the time absolutely fine. The only issues I encounter when I'm PTing is kind of some visual symptoms um, because there's a lot of kind of looking to the side at the laptop when I'm showing something and moving around a lot. I do find that I find it quite hard to focus and that can sometimes be a bit of a pain, but it absolutely doesn't stop me from doing my job. I love my job. I love training my clients. I love exercise and I have to just kind of listen to my body, but I very rarely have had to cancel a PT session. I've only had to do that in the very early stages when I had various things going on in hospital and was acutely unwell. Um, since then, it's been fine. Is your partner a great support in this situation or is it something you face alone? You are so brave. Thank you for saying that, that's very kind. Um, yes, my husband, for anyone new or those who don't know, is actually a doctor himself. 
He is not a neurologist, um, but he is a trauma and orthopedic surgeon. So it kind of works both ways in that he understands a lot more and is therefore able to help a lot more. Um, but he is also desensitized to people's medical problems and things like that. And he's much more of a logical boom, boom, boom kind of person. So he has been amazing for emotional support, but like any other human, there is only so much you can give someone and there's definitely days where he perhaps isn't quite as supportive as he'd like to be because he's very stressed with his own work, he's very tired, he works incredibly long hours, he works so, so hard and that's actually really hard to support someone um, who's going through a chronic illness. All through the kind of beginning parts when I was in hospital and we couldn't be together, which was so sad, and then coming home, that was just such an emotional time for us um, and I've never felt more loved and cared for ever. I'm gonna get emotional, I'm gonna try not to get emotional. I just think it was such a like pivot point in our pivot point, pivotal moment, special and key time in our marriage and our relationship. Um, we've been together for 13 years, I always get confused. I was 14 when we first got together and I'm now 27. So yes, he is a fantastic support. I couldn't have asked for more of a rock through that period of time. But I think I just want to highlight that like anyone, any uh, partner or friend, there's only gonna be so much they can give on every day. And there will be times where perhaps you want more from someone and they just can't give it in that moment in time. And I think it's kind of understanding that that's okay and that doesn't make them unsupportive. Um, it's just part of being human. In the same way, if I'm having a really down day, I can't support him in anything that he's feeling. But yeah, I feel super lucky, especially when it came down to kind of understanding the illness and everything like that. Sam is no expert in MS, but he does have that more kind of deeper understanding of all things medical and hospital appointments and all that kind of stuff and how doctors work and what to expect from a consultant and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, he's been amazing and it's definitely strengthened our relationship. I love how I said this would be quick, by the way, and now it is most definitely not going to be. Um, okay, how are you managing the mental health aspect of receiving your diagnosis? So, sorry, I'm trying to get comfortable. <laughs> so this is a hard one. Um, how am I managing it? I manage it by talking to those closest to me, like I said, and just being really open and honest about everything. Um, and whenever I'm given the opportunity by someone to talk about things, it really helps because it's quite hard to just message someone out of the blue or bring someone out of the blue and have a cry or, or say how hard something's feeling. So I think I have people who kind of do ask how I am and and, and want to know everything and, and I know are there for me 100% so it makes it easier for me to not take the burden on all on my own. Um, so that is probably the number one most key aspect. And the other thing has been connecting with other young people with MS. So I've just found that that's made me feel not alone, it's made me feel not isolated, um, and that in turn just helps me to cope better with everything. There's loads of things I've been doing, like just kind of letting myself be upset, frustrated, angry, bitter, feel just absolute rubbish. I think it's just important to realise that that is normal, that is okay, and that there's gonna be down days, and that doesn't mean it won't get better and there won't be good days, because there will be, and I think that's the thing with mental health, isn't it? It's not linear. It's not, oh, now you've done this, so things are great. It's, it's a very rocky road, and I think as long as you know that it's okay to feel a certain way, it really, really helps, and it takes the pressure off, although I am the worst person for putting pressure on myself, and I get so frustrated if I'm not feeling quite how I want to be for something. Um, you know, if you've got certain things you want to achieve in the day or a social thing happening, it is hard, so I'm not denying that it's hard, and I think that's the number one thing, is admitting that if you've got MS or you're going through a chronic illness diagnosis, that it is a lot, and you need to give yourself time. And you're not gonna wake up one day and everything's gonna be better, it's just kind of a process of, of getting through each day and realizing that there are plenty of good days and normal days. Yeah, I think that would be my answer, long-winded one. Oh, I would say actually that I haven't myself reached out for counseling or anything. I've actually done CBT through the NHS for previous anxiety and insomnia issues. 
um, which I did find helpful, but I, I feel like in a good place with it. I don't really feel like I need that right now. Um, if I could afford it, I would 100 million percent have a, a therapist or a counsellor who I saw fortnightly or even just monthly or weekly if I needed it to just kind of talk through everything because I really do think it's invaluable having that kind of objective person who's almost a bit of a soundboard and helps you work through things. Um, but yeah, I just can't really afford that right now. <laughs> okay, looking back, did you have symptoms before your diagnosis? Yes, absolutely. Quite a number of things in 2018. I had two episodes of facial numbness. I then had my obviously my big relapse that led to my diagnosis, which someone else has asked, did your di diagnosis start from double vision or other symptoms? So my diagnosis came from a relapse that included lots of things, but mainly uh, left side from head to toe, numbness and pins and needles, which lasted for weeks, and then double vision, which came on after the pins and needles and numbness. So that kind of answers that question. Um, and I also had kind of dizziness, vertigo, and just really altered sensations and vision. Um, but yeah, previous to that, the facial numbness and things like temperature sensitivity, I developed an uh, allergic reaction to heat or getting hot during exercise in 2016 and it was awful at the time. I couldn't do a workout without breaking out in hives and my eyes swelling up and long story short, my consultant thinks that it's linked and it's to do with inflammation in the brain and, and temperature sensitivity is an MS symptom as well as that things like uh my mood so i went through a really bad period of anxiety and insomnia in 2019 and i do have quite a bit of nerve damage in the part of my brain that kind of controls that for lack of a better word can't think right now um and so it's also possible that that affected that but i wouldn't have realized that it was like a relapse or a flare at the time but yeah that's really interesting symptoms of ms do include things like sleep problems and things like that what has been your scariest moment so oh this is hard i think the first thing that comes to mind is being in hospital on my own Sam and I were in a &E together and when he admitted me to stay overnight so that I could get an urgent MRI it was positive because that's what we'd really wanted but that feeling of like oh my god I'm actually going to stay in hospital like that was really scary and then Sam having to leave um, and just yeah being on my own in hospital for two nights on a stroke ward that was definitely scary and horrible and having the diagnosis given to me by a lovely doctor, um, but having to deal with that on my own, even though I was prepared it was coming, it, it was definitely scary. And then the other thing that comes to mind that was like post-hospital was seeing my brain scans. Um, I don't know if everyone gets to have a good look or if it was just because Sam asked the consultant at the, my consultant at the time to see them um, because he understands all that. I was really, really shocked seeing it um, and I think it, it definitely scared me and made me emotional because, um, yeah, there's a lot on there <laughs> which shouldn't be there. Um, so that was definitely scary. Okay, how do your family deal and support you? I am a sibling of someone with MS. Oh, bless you. That must be really tough because it's quite difficult to know what to do or say I think. I think the best way to support someone is to check in and I know it's really hard when someone's more acutely unwell you know in hospital or just come out of hospital to think that that's the time you should be checking in but actually what I found is that although that's obviously really good to do that and really helpful it's also a really overwhelming time and um, I think just making sure the person knows that you are there for them by just saying I'm here for you if you need me, I'm here for you if you want to talk or phrasing things like no need to reply but and then I found that the people who did that made me feel like I then wanted to talk to them just because it makes you feel kind of looked after and calm and reassured and also like no pressure and it kind of makes you gravitate towards that so that's the first thing as like a first point of you know diagnosis and 
or come out of hospital or whatever it may be. Um, but what I was going on to say was that that's important, but I think checking in later, like as time goes on, it is so important because although being a lifelong illness, someone wouldn't expect you to be checking in literally every week for the rest of their life. I think through the kind of diagnosis period and the treatment period where you're still like deciding on treatment and being put on treatment or whatever, that is like just as hard as, as the, the beginning stuff. So I think it can sometimes feel quite lonely because you feel like you've got a lot of, you know, contact and things and then it kind of drops off and then you're still in this phase of like finding things really difficult and scary and emotional and you actually feel like, hang on, this is when I need the support. So that would be my biggest kind of bit of advice is just to like make sure the person knows you're there, ask how they are and when they reply, make sure you reply because <laughs> Sometimes I think there's a tendency to kind of box tick and make sure, oh, I'll just send them a message. But then if you don't, then kind of turn it into a conversation where you're listening and understanding or giving them a call, then it's kind of a bit pointless and it can sometimes make someone feel a bit lonelier, if that makes sense. So I think it's kind of knowing to check in and listen and be there and actually immerse yourself in conversation. Yeah, that's my number one thing. And also educating yourself. So taking the time to look, in, look at leaflets that that person's been given. Um, I found it really upsetting because I've got leaflets on MS that I got given and most of the people I'm close to haven't even looked at them because, not, not because they're bad people, but because of lockdown and everything, I haven't actually had that time where people would be visiting and I'd say, oh, please read this or whatever. Um, so I think making sure you go on websites like the MS Trust, um, or just googling things um, and if that person is talking about it then just re-listening basically. Yeah I think that's all the advice I would give on that. Um, it can be really really hard for people but I think that being honest is also the number one thing like if you don't know what to say or you don't know what you can do then then say that like say I'm really not sure how to support you can you let me know what you'd like or can you link me to something that you'd like me to read so I can understand more or whatever it is. I think it's just too often in life we just kind of leave things for, for being scared of what to say. And I think it's important to kind of push through that and just be really honest because um, otherwise the person might think you just don't want to talk to them anymore or don't want to support them and that can be really hard as well. So yes, those are my little bits of advice. I hope they're helpful and I'm sure you're doing an amazing job. Don't forget that you can only do your best and, you know, it's a big thing for everyone, for the person diagnosed and for you as well. So, yeah, just also make sure you have got people to support you as well. Did you ever have a normal MRI before you're one with lesions? So, just to break this down, um, for MS you have a brain and spine MRI scan. It takes like an hour or more actually. It's really quite long. Um, I've had three in total, I had two in the kind of hospital stage, <clears throat> which was scary. Um, and the answer to that is no, I, that's my first MRI ever. So I had to have my MRI like on my own in hospital with no one there, it was pretty scary. And for lots of people who've had an MRI in different parts of your body, it may not seem as scary, but for the brain one, you're kind of put in this like cage thing and then you're inside a little tunnel thing so it's not good if you're claustrophobic but if you're having one then it really is okay you get used to them even though they're not very pleasant so it's normal to feel a bit uneasy um but that was my first one so the only brain scan i've seen is from when there's been quite a few lesions and then on the, my most recent one in february i had uh more lesions so it kind of showed that it was quite active and progressing but because I don't have previous scans, it's quite hard to see which time, well, you know, exactly when it started or how quickly it has been progressing. If it has been since 2016 or if it's been for longer than that or later than that. So yes, no is the answer to that one. The next question is, do you think that MS may have contributed to causing anxiety slash sleep problems? Yes, I do. I actually do believe this. Um, I think I went through a really difficult phase of anxiety in 2019, like I said before. Um, that could have been down to a number of different things. And I'm quite an anxious person anyway, so that's not completely out of the blue for me. 
but I do believe that based on where some of the lesions are, lesions is nerve damage by the way, sorry I meant to say that before, it does kind of make sense that they are connected to affecting that part of your brain that controls your mood and your mental health and everything. So I do believe that perhaps I had um, damage there in 2019 and that kind of flared everything up as it were. I don't know if that entirely makes sense, but it makes sense in my head. And on the kind of other side of that is going through a diagnosis and that period of time where you're having a health scare and trying to get answers and dealing with symptoms and feeling unwell, that's obviously a very anxiety provoking time. So it also doesn't help on that level. Um, and you definitely don't have restful night's sleep when you're worrying about everything and especially not when you're on steroids. But my sleep has actually never been better. I've got to touch wood. Um, but I feel like I've overcome so much in the last year, pretty much, of just kind of getting to grips with my sleep anxiety. I think I will do a full video about this at some point. Um, but I just feel much more in control of that kind of fear. Ooh, okay, how do you cope with fatigue, especially with all the PT that you do? So yes, yeah, so I do find that on the days where I have more clients, so on Friday I tend to have my most amount of clients and I'm very unrealistic, shall we say, because I then make a massive to-do list for after those sessions of, you know, clean the whole house, do X, Y, and Z. And I'm usually knackered after those sessions. So I do think it does affect me more than it, more than like I used to ever be affected. So I just have to be careful, you know, not to put in too much active active stuff on one day um, and just kind of, if I do feel really exhausted afterwards, just take the pressure off and say, right, you can do the other stuff another day. I have to just be a bit more realistic and make sure I'm resting so it doesn't all kind of build up and get too much. But in terms of fatigue and exercise in general, I do believe that keeping active and doing exercise actually improves fatigue and overall and makes me more energized. Um, I think there is evidence to suggest that that is actually a thing. Um, I've also done a post all about exercise and having MS and how it affects it um, on Instagram. So I'll leave the link to that below if you want to know more about exercise, link to having a chronic illness. But yeah, I do definitely find that I've had to adapt the exercise that I do, like the style of training personally. But in terms of taking my PT sessions, it's definitely manageable. And yeah, if you are looking for a personal trainer, then I offer virtual sessions, shameless plug. Um, and obviously I understand what it's like to have a chronic illness and have better days where you're more energized and worse days where you're not feeling it. So yeah, I can definitely guide you through what kind of exercise suits you. And I offer hour long sessions that you can do weekly or fortnightly or whatever. So yes, that's the plug over. <laughs> Okay, I think this is the final exercise one. Um, has strength training helped you with your MS? So I feel like I can't fully answer this because I was only diagnosed five months ago. I have done strength training for, gosh, yeah, since sort of 2015. So I don't know. And because the gyms have been shut and stuff, I don't feel like I've actually been lifting a substantial amount of weight to know if strength training helps anything. Obviously having muscle strength is great and maybe that's why I haven't had as many kind of problems with mobility or strength or coordination because I'm always working on balance and things but equally I, I don't know enough to say that and I can't, I just can't say, I just can't say everyone do the workouts that I do and your MS symptoms will be less because it's different for everyone and I, I actually can't tell. It is something I will continue to do. I can't wait to join a gym again and start lifting some heavier weights again. There are so many benefits to weightlifting that definitely coincide with helping with MS symptoms. Um, you just have to be careful not to overdo it, basically. Did you have any other health issues that were diagnosed before MS? No, that's a really good question actually. I don't think I've ever had anything apart from eczema and the kind of allergy side of things um, that I explained before, which I've only, like that didn't really have a diagnosis. I've just been on strong prescription antihistamines ever since, which really help keep my temperature or heat response under control. Oh, apart from glandular fever, sorry. I do talk about this quite a lot in my previous video. Um, there's quite a strong link between the Epstein-Barr virus, which gives you glandular fever, um, and MS. So that kind of definitely ties in with my diagnosis. Um, and that was quite important to let the doctor know during that diagnosis stage. Okay, we have three more questions. I promise I'm nearly there. How did you decide which medication to try? There are so many out there. So the way this worked for me, <laughs> excuse me, 
is um, I got given a leaflet, I think it's by the MS Trust, and at the back it has all about DMTs, which are disease modifying treatments, or I think they're also called DMDs, which are disease modifying drugs, and it has like an open out thing, and then it basically has first line drugs, and then like drugs for like more active MS, and it has like all the names and then tells you what form they take so whether a pill, an injection, an infusion and it kind of very briefly goes through the side effects of each one, what it's used for, how it works. So if I was you I would start by getting something like that, mine came from my MS nurse. Um, you will also be able to access the information on the MS Trust website and then it's also talking through your consultant so my choices were largely led by what my consultant was saying. So initially, my first consultant, who wasn't an MS specialist, thought I should go on uh, the self-injectables, which are a first-line treatment, which are quite weak. Um, they have a much lower percentage of helping prevent relapses, but they're good for people who maybe don't have as many lesions, whose MS isn't as strong or active. Um, but when I saw the MS specialist, he said, whoa, there's actually a lot going on here and you need to be on stronger treatment. So that obviously then pushed me to try, I think he gave me the option of like three or four. Um, so yeah, your doctor will def definitely, definitely be able to guide you of what they think is best suited to you. Um, and then there's things to consider like family planning. There's some drugs that are not pregnancy safe at all and you will, would need to be off them for 18 months or something until it's then safe to, to even start trying to conceive, um, whereas there's some that you can take and things like that. So that's also a big thing. If you are a woman, it's really important to think about what stage of life you're at. Obviously, if you're quite a bit older and you've already had children, then you don't need to worry. Um, if you're a bit younger, you might want to kind of keep your options open with that and go for something that's more suited to that, basically. So. Yes, that is what led me on to be on Tysabri. I should mention in the video, I won a monthly infusion called Tysabri. Did you get all of your feelings slash sensations back? Um, I did, yes, after my relapse. The steroids helped speed up recovery, but I do still have ongoing issues linked to those previous relapses. So I explained in my other video, so for example, with my eyes, um, the muscles, the muscle strength that moves the eyes will never be perfect because it's had the damage that it's had, um, which caused the double vision. I now have a lot of issues with kind of focusing or moving the eye um, and that making me feel dizzy or like car sick um, because it's not quite going where it needs to go. Um, so I do still have ongoing issues, it's not perfect. Um, but in terms of the pins and needles and numbness, that is back to normal. I do still get a lot of weird sensations. I get a lot of tingling. Oh, I actually just realized I missed a question which says, do you get strange sensations often? So the answer to that one is yes, I get a lot of sensations. I get tingling in my fingertips, tingling up my back, tingling in the side of my head, which I'm having loads today, which kind of freaks me out. But also I think it's just because I'm quite overwhelmed and like go 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 this week it's as <laughs> aware this week and I'm like gotta do everything which is a bit ironic isn't it um so yes I definitely get weird sensations but on the whole my kind of relapse symptoms have healed quite well so I think for some people they do have more severe lasting damage um which of course you really hope doesn't happen um and I really feel for anyone who's still got really ongoing issues because it's just yeah it's just rubbish Okay, so I lied when I said there's three more questions. I've got two more now. Um, and they are, have you changed your lifestyle or your diet? And someone else said, have you changed your diet slash alcohol? So the short answer to that is no. My consultant who is an MS specialist, he's amazing. He told me not to change anything about my diet. Um, I eat quite balanced, so I eat healthy things. I also eat unhealthy things. Um, but on the whole, I'm very much, you know, home cook all my meals. I do think I'm making more of a conscious effort to cut back dairy and meat. Um, so we do, well, I cook a lot more plant-based options now um, and I really enjoy it. And I would say we try and have a good kind of balance of some meat dishes, some fish and some completely veggie or vegan. Um, so I do feel like I've made a little bit of a change um, not just because of MS, but also because of just everything else. 
I know that lots of people will disagree with me on this, but there isn't a lot of solid evidence to suggest that eating, you know, completely plant-based changes the disease. I, I'm pretty sure that there's no evidence to show that it reduces number of lesions or, you know, anything like that. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence and I think there's evidence to suggest it can help with symptoms. So I'm sure you might feel more energised, less fatigued if you make certain diet swaps and, you know, it might make other symptoms more manageable. But, you know, I don't have MS because I've eaten meat and dairy in the past. Um, it's got no one cause and I also know of plenty of people who are vegan or vegetarian or have mainly eaten plant-based who have still developed MS. So I think there's a bit of a kind of misconception that you need to do this and it makes this better or if I did this, I wouldn't have this, but it's just absolutely not the case. And I think it's a personal choice. There might be some consultants out there who tell their patients to um, completely change their diet, but I think it, just really depends on the knowledge and the research that the consultant has or has done um, and the individual patient as well. Sorry, this is so long-winded. Um, I feel like it's something I could talk about for ages and I'm getting pins and needles in my foot. Um, but yes, I think I've become more mindful, um, but it definitely doesn't stop me from doing anything. Like I've been pretty adamant about the fact that I never want to be out in a restaurant and want to order my favourite dessert and think to myself, oh, is this gonna make me have a relapse? Or, oh, is this gonna make my MS worse? Because like, that is just not a way to live. But I just never want to be made feel guilty for eating or drinking something. And especially the advice I've been given, which is not to change anything. Um, the main thing is supplementing vitamin D, which I do do every day. Um, but I wasn't deficient in that anyway, but it's worth doing as it's quite an important one for MS. And alcohol, no, I haven't changed anything with alcohol. I've always kind of drunk the same. I probably drink a couple of times a week. I usually like, you know, Friday night, Saturday night, um, I'll have some wine or some cocktails. I'm not an excessive drinker um, and I don't usually drink midweek. So I don't really feel like that's something I need to cut back on personally. And again, I'm still gonna enjoy my glass of wine because it makes me happy and happiness is everything when you've got a chronic illness because it does help relieve stress and the last thing you want to do is stress and scrutinize about every little thing in your diet and actually cause more problems than you'd be solving um is my opinion anyway and the final question is i feel scared i'm going to have a relapse often do you this makes me really sad because it's kind of quite emotional hearing someone say i feel scared because that's not something you say very often, like I've been scared a lot in the last five months but you don't ever say I feel scared do you? I'm really sorry you're feeling scared, that's a really horrible feeling to have. I try not to get worried about it, I definitely have, it's not easy to ignore and the uncertainty of a disease like MS is really really hard because it is unknown and you can get caught up in thinking if I do this will it cause this? And especially if you've been having lots of relapses over and over again. I had one earlier this year um, before I started Tysabri, which gave me right hand numbness. And it's, when I woke up like that, I was just like, here we go again. Like, And it is really scary because you think, is it going to give me double vision again? Am I going to go blind in one eye? Like, it is, it is so scary. But I think if you can get on to a treatment, it really helps you feel as if you are getting some control back and that feeling will hopefully settle. And I think also just making sure you're taking the pressure off yourself. Like this is not your fault. You don't have MS because of something that you did. You have MS for an unknown reason because we don't know why the immune system attacks the central nervous system. We don't know why it happens. And that's the difficulty. So. Of course the unknown is scary, but I think if you try not to think that everything you're going to do is going to affect your MS and try to just kind of live as normally as you can whilst being mindful, then I think that that's all you can do and you can only ever do your best and just making sure if you do feel like your symptoms are flaring and something's not quite right, to give yourself the time to rest, um, to seek help, to talk to people and just know that you have an amazing support network around you whether that's family and friends, whether it's your MS nurse that you can reach out to, whether it's a support group online, um, I'll link MS Together, who I've talked about before, who are a group for young people with MS, 
um, who are amazing um, and on the Facebook group everyone's always chatting about different things and there's always someone you can relate to. I think knowing that you're not alone as well and knowing that lots of other people have the same fear will also help you not be so scared if that makes sense but you know your feelings are absolutely valid. It is scary and nobody wants to have a relapse but just know that if it does happen you will be taken care of and everything will be okay. Right I think I'm going to end the video here before I talk anymore but it was really good to answer your questions i really hope you found something helpful in there learned something about ms if you don't have it or felt reassured if you do everyone's answer to those questions will be totally different because ms is so different for every person so please remember that this is based just on my experience and then my personal thoughts and opinions which aren't always going to be the same as everyone else's. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and click the subscribe button if you liked it. Please don't forget to check out my Instagram where I have been posting lots of content about MS and different topics. And I hope you are all doing well. I just wanted to say that if you're watching this and have MS, then you are amazing. You are doing so, so well. And just remember to take every day as it comes and remember that you are never alone. Thank you so much again and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye!